Introducing the Walgreens Boots Alliance Corporate Social Responsibility Report. As we look back on 2020, we see a year marked by adversity, but defined by unity. A year inspired by innovation and powered by partnerships. A year rooted in resilience and strengthened by unshakable courage. As a global leader in retail and pharmacy, Walgreens Boots Alliance has and always will be a global force for good, touching the lives of millions every day. And this year was no exception. In a moment of global uncertainty, the organization stood up and stepped forward, working on the front line, providing life-saving care, supporting the vulnerable when they needed it most, and advancing its purpose to help people live healthier and happier lives. Through long-term partnerships, Walgreens Boots Alliance has helped provide life-saving vaccines and life-changing vitamins to hundreds of millions of women and children, and raised millions of dollars to help end child poverty and change young lives. The organization was recognized for its work on an international scale, receiving accolades and acknowledgments for its partnerships, integrity, inclusion efforts, and charitable initiatives. Across its business, Walgreens Boots Alliance continued to make sustainability a priority, reducing its carbon footprint and cutting waste sent to landfills. And the company pledged to do much more to provide vital nutritional support, reaching a total of 400 million women and children in the next three years, to raise millions for cancer organizations, and to help provide a total of 100 million immunizations by 2024. And throughout it all, the beating heart of health beats on, providing a lifeline on the front line and keeping the unity in our community. Because across the world, in every home, in every town, in every city, each of us deserves a healthier and happier tomorrow. Hello and welcome. I'm Rena Nine, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Health and Humanity, lessons from the global front line hosted by Bloomberg Media Brand Experiences. Today's event honors the health sector and it celebrates the release of Walgreens Boots Alliance CSR report. Responsible business has always been in WBA's DNA. From 1849, when the first Boots chemist opened in the UK, and 1901, when Walgreens opened its first community pharmacy in the US. Since then, WBA has remained focused on improving access to health care. We'll hear today about pharmacists caring for people in their local communities and on the front lines during the pandemic. We'll also address health inequalities and share progress on their sustainability commitments. We're fortunate to be joined today by an esteemed group of industry leaders and experts. And you'll see some powerful examples of WBA CSR programs and partnerships in the video stories shared throughout the event. But before we get started, I'd like to mention a few things. We've partnered with Thyssen. It's an audio to text platform that's transcribing today's discussions in real time, making the event more accessible. So please engage with us on social media using hashtag heart of health. And a very big thanks to all of you for tuning in to today's event. Well, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Ornella Barra, Walgreens Boots Alliance Co-Chief Operating Officer. Ornella Barra has been highly commended for her sustainability leadership as chair of the company's Corporate Social Responsibility Committee. And she plays a pivotal role in ensuring CSR thrives at WBA. Her passion and her involvement in all WBA's partnerships has also ensured that WBA remains a force for good. Ornella. Good morning and uh, good afternoon. Many thanks uh, to our Chief Executive Stefano Pessina for uh, his participation uh, and his message. And uh, now, let me start uh, by thanking our external speaker, Alice Gursky, Chief Executive of Johnson & Johnson, and uh, to Jean-Paul Agon, Chief Executive of L'Oreal, for the great uh, partnership we have built with these uh, two companies in several years. And, uh, for sparing some time in their busy agenda to be here with us today. 
our new board member, Valerie Jarrett, which will share her experience and the learnings. Dr. Sally Uran, Chief Executive at the Forum for the Future, the global charity that advising on our current CSR materiality assessment. Also, special thank to our Director of Corporate Social Responsibility, Richard Ellis, his team and all other teams you have contributed to this year's report, including finance, communication and the CSR. The CSR Committee of WBA, especially to our Chief Administrative Office International, Frank Standish, and to Fiona Ortiz, Director of Financial Communication and CSR Reporting, Deloitte & Touch for their support, Bloomberg for making today's event such a special occasion. We publish this year's edition of our CSR report at a time when the most incredible and challenging crisis in our lifetime is unfortunately still ongoing. COVID-19 has had a profound and, in many cases, tragic impact on our communities, our customers and our people. As a chair of the Corporate Social Responsibility Committee, of Walgreens Boost Alliance have never felt more proud to see how people across the WBA have a coming together unit. In particular, our colleagues who are work in our stores, behind the pharmacy counter, in our warehouses, how drive our vehicle for so many months now they have been on the front line of the pandemic. They embody the true spirit of WBA and the clear show that our company play a crucial role in society as a patient and the consumer depend on us for medication and essential item purchase and the delivery in a safe environment, for respect, information and the care for COVID-19 testing and, the more recently, vaccination. In 2020, WBA joined the Down Joint Sustainability North America Index. This is the best recognition of the company's outstanding performance in corporate sustainability and the best testament of the extraordinary contribution of our WBA people to what we have been able to achieve in fiscal 2020 despite the pandemic. With cancer organization in particular raising $10.8 million for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and the Susan Come in our first year of a partnership, Bulls raising $1 million for Macmillan in the UK bring the cumulative total to $20.85 million since this partnership was launched in 2009. And the true our Spectre platform we create across Europe in collaboration with the RTC recruiting 1,000 new patients in less than one year. In helping children in particular, providing life-changing vitamins to more than 250 million women and children around the world through our partnership with Vitamin Angel. We have extended the commitment to three more years to reach a total of 400 million through Walgreens raising over $15 million for Red Nose Day through the Walgreens Get a Shot, Give a Shot program where we provide over 60 million life saving vaccine to children in developing countries. In reducing waste, plastic, packaging and emission, let me mention that Walgreens was recognized as a goal achiever for the Better Building Challenge for rich its energy intensity reduction commitment in fiscal 2020. In promoting a healthy and inclusive workplace, we published our first global diversity inclusion report for WBI, covering fiscal years 2018 and 2019, 
and added inclusion to our company value. In 2020, WBA plays such a crucial role in a such a challenging circumstance. Our global brand division has been doing a tremendous job in terms of PPE. With an average of 100 million per month mask and over 2 million units of gloves sourced since April. As of mid-January, Walgreens has completed over 3.2 million COVID tests in the US, boots over 2.1 million in the UK. The role we are going to play in 2021 is even bigger in helping bring the pandemic to an end. Walgreens became administering a vaccine back in December to high risk and ready individual in long-term care facilities and the medical care provider and expect to administer 30 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine in the US by the end of this summer. Boots' first vaccination took place in Halifax in January, and we have developed a program to assist National Care System England and relieve pressure of GPs. Across Europe, we are already involved in COVID vaccine distribution in several countries through Aloga and Alliance Care. As I often say, a company can be a great company only when it thinks of others. This is the only way all of us can really feel part of our purpose, thank to the ideas, passion, commitment of our colleagues. We can do much for the progress of our community. I want to thank all of them. Without the support, we would not have been able to develop and deliver so many impactful programs, especially in a year when each raising fund, event and the volunteering were several disrupted by COVID-19 restrictions. Thank again and I'm looking forward to a great event. There's tremendous personal sacrifice that's happening around the company right now. I know people are putting other things in their life second and third to this. We never had to ask them to do it either. They're just doing it. I mean, I'm pretty active, and um, I will, I'd like to stay that way. And I think this shot's going to help me do that. I feel as if this is the first link out of my chain. I really could cry, I'm that happy about getting it. I'm very happy to introduce Stefano Piscina, Executive Vice Chair and CEO WBA. He is a highly recognized global healthcare entrepreneur and visionary leader. He is widely commended as well for his contributions to the retail pharmacy and pharmaceutical wholesale industries over his career of five decades. But he's not just known for his business savvy. He also cares deeply for the communities where the company operates around the world and is highly committed to CSR. Stefano. Good morning, or good afternoon, everyone. The title we have chosen for our 2020 
Corporate Social Responsibility Report couldn't be more apt. These unprecedented times have made all of us realize what a tremendous responsibility we have as a leading global pharmacy retailer and distributor in providing an essential public service within the communities we serve. With the CSR agenda taking center stage in the boardrooms of the world and becoming increasingly integrated into business strategy, investors pay more attention than in the past to the responsibilities a company holds to the public and not just shareholders. Reinforcing ourselves as a caring corporate citizen and operating sustainability for people and the planet becomes imperative at all time, not only in time of crisis. Of course, as a result of the COVID crisis, some key issues have come even more clearly under the spotlight with the inevitable disruptions to global supply chains, for example, consumers demand a better understanding of where products come from. If they want to know that what they see, it's what they get. Transparency, traceability, accountability, top certification and quality standards will be even more imperative in COVID and post-COVID times. The pandemic has dramatically exposed the stark inequalities within and between countries, which I am afraid will be further accelerated by the economic impact of the pandemic. The expected global downturn could push millions into poverty in the next few years, as well as disproportionately impact those in low income growth and poor countries. With uh, producers uh, lose income, the risk of uh, child labor, forced labor, and the other human rights abuses in global supply chains becomes greater. But this goes beyond the supply chains. When it comes to inequalities, let me say this is an overarching concerning matter for our societies. One I am particularly worried about, and I do believe corporates should take more seriously than they have done in the past. I wish we all realize that the working toward the reduction of inequality is in everyone's interest, even when this is not economically convenient in the short term. The fight against COVID-19 must not distract us from tackling what is, by definition, the existential problem for humanity in the 21st century, climate change. If anything, the disruption brought by the pandemic resulted in climate change moving a long way up the political agenda. We have an enormous opportunity to rethink the future. Take renewables, for example. According to the International Energy Agency's newly published Global Energy Report, emissions had been forecast to grow 1% in 2020 and uh, will likely be down almost 8% this year. We must seize this unique chance arising with the pandemic to speed energy transition. Last but by no means least, as a caring corporate citizen, we aim to be an example of diversity and respect. A worldwide quest for racial equity emerged strongly in 2020. We responded by making clear that our company values racial injustice, listening to our diverse employees regarding their needs and bolstering our already robust diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Our board of directors has increased its own diversity and the board's compensation and leadership committee 
and the proof linking the portion of incentive pay to performance on our DEI goals. So, thanks to our partners and colleagues, their loyalty, generosity, and dedication have made and keep on making such a positive difference. Listening to Stefano Pacina's vision for a sustainable future, it's not surprising that he's chosen to partner with other business leaders committed to sustainability. So let's hear from our next speakers, Alex Gorski, Chairman and CEO of Johnson & Johnson, and then Jean-Paul Lagon, Chairman and CEO of L'Oreal. Hello, everyone. I'm Alex Gorski, Chairman and CEO of Johnson & Johnson. And I want to congratulate Walgreens Boots Alliance on the launch of your annual CSR report. Now it's clear that when it comes to making an impact on the health and well-being of communities around the world, you are leading by example. A report like this, well, it is critical in showing how sustainability and corporate social responsibility infuse every aspect of your business. At Johnson & Johnson, We've seen these commitments come to life in our close collaboration with WBA. As one of our important partners, WBA is helping us advance a world where healthy people can thrive in healthy communities on a healthy planet. COVID-19 has shown us that we need to find ways to support good health in all our communities. It's reaffirmed our commitment to solving some of the greatest global health and environmental challenges well beyond the pandemic. For example, last year, with all that was happening, our Johnson & Johnson consumer health team continued to push forward and launch the Healthy Lives mission to improve human health, protect our environment, and preserve natural resources with $800 million in investments through 2030. Now, this commitment enables us to continue to drive high-value initiatives like our multi-year partnership with WBA on everything from lung cancer prevention, including smoking cessation, to broader health screenings for early detection of skin cancer. And together, we are finding innovative solutions to create a better, healthier world. So as you read through this report, I hope you're inspired by the positive momentum and you're motivated to keep making a difference for all your stakeholders. There's more work to be done but companies like WBA are transparently showing us what happens when we all take steps towards a healthier world for all. There are obviously a lot of synergies between the goals and commitments of our two companies on corporate responsibility. We are both looking for ways to embed sustainability at every stage of the value chain. To build a sustainable marketplace, for example, we are both taking firm stance when it comes to improving the environmental footprint of products through eco-design and to enhancing transparency about ingredients, materials and product safety. Our new sustainability program, L'Oréal for the Future, lays out our commitments to put L'Oréal's action in line with the only possible scenario for humanity, respecting planetary boundaries across the entire life cycle of our products. We do not want to just do better. We want to do what is needed for the planet. Like Walgreen Boots Alliance with their Healthy Communities, Healthy Planet pillars, we are contributing to solve pressing social and environmental challenges and build a sustainable and inclusive future. L'Oréal and Walgreen Boots Alliance are united by our common vision for a sustainable future. And this partnership has created key recycling programs that are reducing waste, both from products and from merchandising. Since 2019, Boots and Maybelline are working together to recycle makeup merchandising elements. This initiative has already diverted over 22,000 kilograms of waste from landfills, corresponding to 75% of waste generated through permanent merchandising updates. Boots is one of our key partners on this initiative having implemented makeup recycling stations in nearly 300 stores across the UK. We are changing the dynamics of the relationship between a manufacturer and a retailer into a partnership. I am convinced that inspiring and empowering responsible consumers is our biggest challenge, but also opportunity going forward. More than ever, 
they are looking for choices of products and brands that reflect their own values and are highly receptive to the sustainability message. We believe that the more they know, the better they can act and make informed, sustainable choices. Transparency is the name of the game, and this is yet another priority we share with World Green Boots Alliance. We must demonstrate that our companies can be part of the solution to today's most pressing environmental and social challenges. This year, our group donated, for example, 15 million hand sanitizers to essential retail staff and pharmacists, including Boots colleagues, working on the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic. As we transform ourselves with the changing expectation of companies, we hope to be a catalyst of change and to inspire our customers and all people to take action with us. We know that together we have only one decade to act. This is why companies with shared values must partner. Now it is an absolute emergency. We must keep rallying our consumers, our suppliers and our clients. Only together can we have a real impact. My name is Matthew and I've been working for Boots for 16 years. I'm a community pharmacist. During the pandemic, we've always stayed open and we've always been available to patients. Boots and Macmillan have been working together since 2009 to provide information and support to people affected by cancer. One of the first things we said at the beginning of the pandemic in March was we've got to be there for people affected by cancer. We've taken both our Boots Macmillan Information Pharmacists and our beauty advisors into an online space, so we now have, have virtual advice being offered. My daughter was diagnosed with infant leukaemia in December 2018, and during the pandemic, she was required to shield due to her reduced immune system. It's also important for me to work from home because it keeps my daughter and my family safe. I felt the, the role of the pharmacist and, and my job took on a greater importance during the pandemic. Some of the patients are vulnerable in shielding, so meeting virtually is perfect for them because it enables them to stay safe. It's been really good being able to meet face to face with online and virtual consultations, even though I'm not there physically. At the end of the day, we get out of bed every day to go to work to help people affected by cancer. It makes me feel a bit tearful, it makes me feel really proud. Through partnerships like the one with Boots and Macmillan, we need to do even more to help people when they need us the most. WBA employs 36,000 pharmacists, many located in communities where access to healthcare is limited. They provide a vital frontline service to people around the world, not just this year, but even in years past. Joining us now are two incredible pharmacists I want you to meet, Stephen Fadewale from Walgreens and Bhavika Mystery from Boots. Thank you both for joining us. We're so grateful for your time. Bhavika, I want to start with you. You're coming to us from Halifax. What are some of the challenges that you've had to face under COVID? Oh, so since the pandemic hit, we've faced many challenges. So a lot of the GP shut their doors. So we were the forefront of healthcare in England. So um, people came to us for the healthcare need. We had lots of vulnerable people in our local communities that didn't have a support network. And we were relied upon to deliver them their medication. We delivered them essential things just to make sure that they had everything they needed in this time of uncertainty. Um, so we went out of our way, had to change what we did um, to deal with what was in front of us, and it changed day by day. But we used the local community and ourselves to support them in any way that we could. Mm. Stephen, what about you? You're coming to us from Chicago. How have you had to rethink things, and what are the challenges you faced? I mean, I think the biggest thing for us in Chicago is meeting the community where it needed us the most. Um, our zip code um, is actually one of the most hardest heat um, zip codes with the coronavirus. And in addition to that, we're also an underserved community in, you know, in Chatham of, of Chicago. And being able to also provide testing is also one of the things that we've also been able to, to, um, to gather around of. I think the biggest thing was having a, a testing at a store where if a patient comes to pick up a medication, they could leave the store, go into the drive-thru and also get tested. And you also have to think about the role of a pharmacist um, where that 
person in the community where the, 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 the patients come into to answer questions. Of course, when you have um, severe uh, symptoms from the COVID, you should go to the emergency room. But if you have moderate to um, uh, mild symptoms, the first place that you go to come to is the pharmacist. So just being able to rise up to the challenge that happened and just being able to meet the patients at where they needed us the most. Bhavik, I want to talk to you a little bit more about testing and for people coming in also for vaccines. How has that changed your role as a pharmacist? So I've come from my pharmacy to help pilot the first COVID vaccination centre in a Boots Pharmacy in England. So we've got a star um, located in an area, got it up and running, created little, uh, a section that's suitable for vulnerable people to come in and out of within a star setting to get their vaccination done. So it's in the heart of their community, it's where they know it's a local star, it's accessible to everyone. And we've had that up and running within a few weeks. So we've been running since the beginning of January and we've had over 200 people walk through our doors every day. So some of the stories that I've got to tell, so we've had the eldest person we've seen is a 102 year old lady that came through our doors. We've had 90 year old twins and they're so grateful for the service that we're providing because it is on their doorstep. They can come in and get that vaccination from the people that they trust that we've been there throughout the pandemic. And um, the emotion that we see, so them being able to access this vaccine has given them that hope that they can go back to a normal life, that they can see their family and friends, and they'll be able to get out again, because some of these people have been stuck at home, we've had so many people in tears, with just how grateful they are for the services that we are providing, and the fact that we can roll this out to other boot stores throughout England is amazing. So it's accessible everywhere throughout the country for all these people to get vaccinated and hopefully we'll get this new normal. And the new normal is exactly right. Stephen, I want to talk to you also. You're a shining example of how the role of the pharmacist has been revolutionized. You had to face the George Floyd protests. How did that change how you operated? I mean, it was, it was devastating to see a store that, you know, you've literally worked and, you know, you've built up to, to a high standard, you know, been destroyed. But the good thing about it was we were able to take it, take it and, 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 and help that become a, a pinnacle or an example to how we can, how resilient that we are in the community. Um, and think about it, our store was one of the few stores to open back up real fast. And those stores that couldn't open back up, we had to set up mobile clinics. Now that's big when you think about the infrastructure that it takes to set up a pharmacy. And in, in within a week to two weeks, we had those, those, uh, those mobile clinics um, that were opened up. And think about it also, you have patients who in my, in my, in my community also have a high prevalence of diabetes. So because of the fact that we were the few stores to open up, you had other, other stores or other, um, other companies who couldn't open up in the neighborhood. Um, so we had patients that were coming to pick up their medications, but in addition to that, we were open. So because of the fact that we're a food desert, you have our store being able to receive those patients and also help those patients out. And then also, you also have to think about ways that we've been able to adapt and change some of the, the change some of the way that we operate. Like for example, starting up the Health Outcomes Initiative, where yeah. we're able to provide more accessibility to patients with their medications. And guess what we started doing? We started delivering those medications out to the patients, making sure that the patients are able to get that medication when yeah. they need it the most. That is just incredible. Thank you both, Bhavika and Stephen, for your personal touch and seeing this through the eyes of the pharmacists, this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. This past year has really shined a light on communities of color. Next, I'm thrilled to hand over the reins to Carlos Cubia, who was WBA's chief diversity officer. He's joined by Valerie Jarrett, who recently joined WBA's board of directors. They'll be discussing diversity, equity, and inclusion in achieving health parity. Thank you. I am honored to be here today to introduce Ms. Valerie Jarrett. Valerie Jarrett is the pr president of the Obama Foundation and a WBA board member. Previously, she served as senior advisor to President Barack Obama and oversaw the offices of public engagement and intergovernmental affairs. She and I today will be discussing inclusive health care. Hello, Valerie. How are you today? I am well. How are you doing, Carlos? I'm, I'm doing wonderful. Good to see you. You know, Valerie, before we get started, I just wanted to just kind of jump in here really quick and say, it was, I think it was about a year and a half ago, uh, you and I were both in North Carolina and, I, and we were introduced by a mutual friend, Dr. Sheila Robinson, who introduced us uh, at the Diversity Women's Conference. And you and I talked about potentially having you come and speak to our leadership and just bringing some of your insights into WBA. And how excited was I to find out a year later that you had been added to our board of directors. 
So as we think about that move, talk to me about how you made the decision to join WBA and how you can help, how can you help us to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion at this organization? Well, it's a good question. So at this stage of my life, given my background in healthcare, I chaired the board of the University of Chicago Medical Center for a number of years. I worked on the Affordable Care Act when I was a part of the Obama administration. One of the observations and concerns I've always had is the disparity of healthcare uh, across our country. And I have always been a consumer of Walgreens and I and have had a personal relationship with the pharmacists. And so I've always wondered what would happen if Walgreens migrated more into the healthcare space. And so when I was approached to join the board, that is the conversation I had. And it was made clear to me that the strategic direction we were going in was to see what we could do to better provide those preventive and primary care services that are missing from so much of um, the citizens of our country. They don't have access to it. So that's what attracted me in the first place. And so right kind of back to you, uh, Carlos, a big piece of what you're doing is focusing on the issue of uh, closing the gap between um, equity and inclusion. And given our current climate and having been in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic that has had such a disproportionate impact on particularly communities of color, how do you think about this issue now? Well, that's a great question. And when I think about all that we're doing here at Walgreen Boots Alliance, uh, you know, we have termed a motto that we want diversity, equity, and inclusion to be at the center of everything we do. So what does that mean? So when we think about our organization as a whole, we want to make sure that our employees, our customers, the community at large are taken in consideration first and foremost before we make any business decision. As a consumer-based organization, we realize that our mere existence depends on customers and patients coming into our stores and utilizing our services and utilizing our pharmacies and, 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 and the, the things that we have to offer. So that means that we need to understand the community. We need to reflect the community. We need to give back to the community. So when COVID-19 hit, we set up testing centers across the country and 70% of our testing centers for COVID-19 were located in underserved areas. Uh, and these are underserved areas as defined by the CDC Social Vulnerability Index. So we wanted to make sure that we had access, that we were educating the community, and that we were giving them the information that they needed in order to su continue to sustain their lives. The other thing I'd like to throw out is when we look at our internal workforce, we wanted to make sure that our workforce reflected the community where we did, where we do business. So we have pretty solid standards within the organization for our leaders to drive diversity, equity, and inclusion across the organization. Last year, we were also faced with this pandemic, I'm sorry, with this racial equity movement. And throughout that time, many corporations were struggling to put policies and practices in place to deal with that. Well, I'm happy to say that at Walgreen Boots Alliance, we were already down the road with our policies, our procedures, and some of the, the work around equity and inclusion. And some of that work led to us diversifying our board and luckily bringing you on board and promoting goals um, and metrics within our organization to really diversify the team. So many different things. I could go on forever, but I'm going to stop there. I mean, there, there are a number of things that we're doing to drive diversity, equity, and inclusion, not only internally, but externally into the communities. So what I want to come back to you with is Dr. King said many years ago, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So talk about how systemic racism has had an impact on health disparities and what can we do to overcome those challenges, Valerie? Well, you're absolutely right. And I think I've been aware of these disparities. It's one of the reasons the Affordable Care Act had resources in there to study the health disparities so that we could try to close them. Part of it is just the access to quality, affordable health care. The Affordable Care Act was intended to make health insurance more available, more affordable, and in fact has done so. But another piece of it that's been exposed from the COVID-19 is the fact that people aren't getting the same quality, and as a result, their health outcomes have been a lot worse. Chronic illnesses that we know are a contributing factor. And so figuring out ways of closing those disparities 
becomes more acute in the midst of our current pandemic. And so I would really love for you to talk about how are we going to use our strategies to reach people who might be hesitant to take the vaccine, for example, Carlos, because those are the very people who probably have comorbidities that could contribute to worse outcomes should they contract it. So what is Walgreens doing to make sure that we're reaching that population and making it available to them, but also to help talk them into taking the vaccine because the data shows that they're reluctant to do so? Right. Well, so a number of things uh, that we're doing as an organization. So the first thing is we, we want to educate the community and try to regain trust. And we know that regaining trust, there's a number of things that we have to overcome. One is getting the right message out. And the way we get the right message out is to make sure we have the right messenger, making sure that we're use a lot, utilizing people that can interact and that can connect with those communities to really bring the messaging forth that is going to put them at ease. You know, we looked at a study, I think with the Pew Research about a uh, a couple months ago that said that 60% of Americans said they're not taking the vaccine. And of that 60%, 58% of African Americans stated they were not going to take the vaccine. So there have been other issues in our past, in our history, like the Tuskegee experiment that have caused distrust. So what we need to do is to make sure that we're giving the right information, that we're putting out the right education, and we're connecting in the communities uh, and meeting these folks where they are so that they understand that the vaccine is safe and that if we're going to get our life back to normal in this country and across the globe, the vaccine is important. That's so, why I joined the Walgreens board. <laughs> <laughs> and we're glad to have you here. So, Valerie, I know that we're getting low on time. I would really like to thank you for your time today. Thank you for your insights. And I'm really looking forward to you working uh, to help advance diversity, equity, and inclusion within our organization. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Carlos. La mascarilla 19 llega en un momento muy complicado. Y en ese momento está gran parte del país en eh, cuarentena total, lo que implicaba un confinamiento y también implicaba eh, un aumento de la violencia intrafamiliar. Chile es uno de los países que Walgreens Boots Alliance tiene espacios seguros. Junto con el Ministerio de la Mujer, hicimos un trabajo en conjunto para poder difundir los procedimientos y protocolos asociados a la mascarilla 19. Cuando tú estás en una situación amenazante o en este estado de confinamiento, es complejo llamar por teléfono. Pero sí no llama la atención que tú vas a ir a la farmacia. Las personas tienen confianza y saben que a la vuelta de la esquina tienen una farmacia ahumada con la cual pueden contar y pueden venir a hacer sus denuncias. Cosa que cuando las mujeres se acercaban y le decían a quien las atendía mascarilla 19, se activaba un protocolo. Un protocolo donde la farmacia se contactaba a través del 1455 con nosotros, o si era un caso de ultra emergencia directo con carabinero. Como equipo de trabajo, estamos tremendamente comprometidos con el bienestar de nuestra comunidad y Mascarilla 19 es un reflejo de esto. Primero que nada, agradecer a, a todo el equipo de la farmacia a nivel nacional y, y decirles que nunca se olviden eh, que cada uno de ustedes eh, puede ser determinante para la vida de una mujer en nuestro país. presents a unique challenge in ensuring equitable distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine and ensuring that less privileged communities have equal access. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Kevin Ban, who's Walgreens Chief Medical Officer, as well as Dr. Anne Ramoyne, who is a professor of epidemiology at UCLA. And thank you very much for joining me for this fireside chat. There has been a lot of conversation around vaccine hesitancy. And so I'm curious, uh, how do you think about uh, the best ways to overcome some of the vaccine mistrust? Well, thanks for having me. I think that there are a lot of ways that we can be working to, to combat mistrust. 
And first and foremost, that's having information readily available to people that is understandable, that is that resonates with different populations, and is easily accessible. I think that this is really a key factor here, is that the information needs to be easy to find. If I have to spend 20 minutes trying to Google something myself to try and find the right answer, that's not well organized, uh, accessible information. So we need to be much better at that. You know, the, the second thing that we need to do is we need to be doing good research, really understanding what the problems are, where their disconnects, and be able to address them. That's information for action. I'm running a study myself on vaccine hesitancy in a variety of different groups, and it's really helping us pick apart and understand where there are problems. The last thing that we have to do is we have to be going to the communities. We have to meet communities where they are and talk to community leaders, talk to influencers. Influencers. All of the things that we know from, from the research that we've done in places like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where we're constantly working with communities down to, the, to, to every level to really understand what are the problems, what are their questions, and answering those questions. Not the questions we want to answer, but the questions they want answered. So, Kevin... Given the challenge of growing vaccine hesitancy here in the United States, how's Walgreens helping to educate communities how to vaccinate? So one of the most important principles that we focus on is transparency. And so to your point, you really need to make sure that you have the best and most up-to-date information because that builds trust. Not only we then take that and we leverage it across our organization, our platform. So you really need to have an omni-channel approach here. And then I'll tell you, uh, these days we are creating content. It feels almost on a daily, if not hourly basis, based on everything that's going on. And then we sh we're sure to, make, to put that out in different formats. So we'll do that in written form. People can find it in emails uh, that they receive, or they can go to our website. We're doing videos. And so we're trying to really approach it from many different ways uh, so that people get good information. Again, to your point, uh, one of the most important things or one of the strengths that Walgreens has is that we're embedded in communities. And so we have highly respected pharmacists uh, that are there in community and people have relationships with these, these pharmacists. Even before the pandemic, you know, when you wanted information, you just ask across the desk for, in for some information. And now with the information and how complicated it can be, it's really important to lean into those people who are trusted in, in community. We're also working with influencers uh, and then civic leaders. So we're able to identify those people in community who are real thought leaders, and then we're partnering with them to give them voice. So I think I, I'm picking up on a lot of your recommendations. Now, how do you think about really the major factors that drive into vaccine hesitancy? You know, we have a history of vaccine hesitancy in this country. We have the history of vaccine hesitancy globally that our many communities have experienced a lot of misinformation, a lot of disinformation over time. But historically, we've had a continual disenfranchisement by the medical uh, by medical establishments. Examples, for example, are the Tuskegee syphilis experiments or the Guatemala, Guatemala syphilis experiments. And it makes communities very, very hesitant. And that's why having conversations, really understanding what are their fears, what are they worried about? What can we do to work together will make a difference? I think that's the key, is really understanding from their perspective why they're concerned and what we can do to, to impact that. And a perfect example is having people like trusted pharmacists in their communities where they can just ask questions. I think that's going to go a long way towards addressing some of the issues right there in the community and where things can be, where questions can be answered right on the spot. So regarding the vaccine, how is Walgreens reaching underserved communities? Well, you know, the most important thing is that we as a senior leadership team decided that it matters and that we wanted to pay specific attention to health equity. So really from the beginning of the pandemic and as we were setting up testing sites, uh, we have currently about 
just over 2,200 testing sites across the United States, and we're on our way to 3,000. You know, just as a as a fact, uh, more than 70% of them are in underserved, vulnerable minority communities, and we did that purposefully because we decided to follow that vision. Uh, the other thing that's important to understand, and is that we're not starting from scratch here. We're leaning into infrastructure that we've been developing over the course of the last 10 years. And so we are we know how to put up mobile clinics. Uh, we have been doing off-site vaccine, vaccine programs through the flu vaccine. So we're really leveraging a lot of our know-how and we're doing that in community, again, with churches, civic centers, people who are really connected to make it easy. Uh, just for context, over the course of the last 10 years, uh, we have given out more than 1.7 million uh, vouchers to get the flu vaccine. And so we want to do everything that we can to remove barriers and then to really lean into the infrastructure that we have. Hey, Ann, I'm going to end here. Uh, one more question for you, and that is, how do you think about this global pandemic and what will be the long-term impl impl implications that will come from this as it, as it pertains to health equity? Well, I really hope that what we've learned here, if this pandemic hasn't been able to drive this point home, an infection anywhere is an infection everywhere. We need to be able to take care not only of people in our immediate families, our immediate communities, but in the communities around us nationally and globally. And so we have to care about health equity, even if it doesn't seem relevant to somebody who is living uh, in a place where they don't see issues with vaccination or see issues with vaccine hesitancy. It's very important to remember that if everybody doesn't have access to care, doesn't everybody doesn't have access in this case to something like vaccines or testing or PPE or any of these basic things that we need to control a pandemic, we are all going to suffer. And so I think that the message is, is that we're all in this together and that health equity has to be addressed. It has to be addressed from every corner. And that's how we're going to be able to get through it. That's a great point to end on. And you've been really generous with your time. I want to thank you very much. It's been a, a really informative conversation. Thanks for having me. I had a customer come in, she had to get a shingle shot. Last thing I mentioned is, did you know that if you get the vaccine today, a, a child in another country, a developing country, will get a vaccine also? She's like, oh, okay, then I'll definitely do it then. By getting a vaccine at Walgreens, customers can feel good knowing they did their part to protect themselves, their own communities, and help those around the world. We've had a partnership with Walgreens for more than eight years now, the Get a Shot, Give a Shot campaign, which helps customers protect children around the world from vaccine-preventable diseases. With this program, Walgreens has made me realize what the importance of being a pharmacist is. We are promoting vaccines that not only make a difference in our own community, but it makes a difference in someone else's life in a developing country too. For the 2020 Citizens Award, Get a Shot, Give a Shot was recognized as the health and wellness winner. To date, we've provided more than 60 million vaccines for children around the world through this partnership. It's so hard for a child in a developing country to get a vaccine. Being part of the Get a Shot, Give a Shot initiative brings added meaning to what we do. Providing vaccines for someone who needs it. It's also important to me as a person. It's not just my job. We already know that sustainability plays a major role in health, and the way we treat the planet today will have lasting implications for the health of humankind. I'm delighted to introduce Annie Murphy, who's the Global Chief Commercial Officer at Walgreens Boots Alliance, and Sally Murin, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Forum for the Future. They're going to talk a little bit about why a sustainable future is so critical to our health. Sally, it's great to have you with us today and to be able to talk to you. So should we, uh, should we get started? I've got a big question for you, which is you clearly work with a lot of organizations 
um, around the world to deliver systemic change for sustainability. What's the um, pandemic shown us, do you think, in terms about the symbiotic relationship between the sustainability agenda and health? Yeah, um, well, the pandemic has really shone a light on those deep interconnections between our environment, our health and our economy. And the rehearsed story is that COVID began in the wet market in Wuhan associated with um, illegal trading of wildlife. But actually, the story probably goes back even further than that. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that illegal deforestation really unleashes these zoonotic diseases into our food system. And so COVID has really told us that what we do when it comes to our biodiversity can directly affect our human health. And it's not just the links between biodiversity and health that are important. I'm particularly interested in the links between climate and health. And if we think about the changing climate and public health, there are interconnections happening at a global level. We know that climate could undo a lot of progress towards poverty alleviation. Then on a regional level, Rising temperatures mean rising incidences of malaria. We know that that can have deep impacts on global supply chains. And there's even data that suggests that elevated temperatures, elevated rise of non-communicable diseases. So that intersection between climate and health is also really important. And that's why I'm so pleased to be working with World Greens Boots Alliance on really exploring how can we solve for both climate and public health in the same way. And so that brings me to my question for you, Annie, if I may, which is when we think about the WBA brands, can you tell me a bit more about the overarching approach to sustainability? Sure. So, um, so I look after our product brands business and I would tell you we put the customer at the heart of, of absolutely everything we do. And uh, so their expectations of us are a really big sort of driving force. And we know that they expect all of our products to be safe. We expect them, they expect them to be ethically sourced, but they also increasingly are really curious and interested about the sustainability of, of our brands. And um, it's also a really important factor for our employees who are extremely passionate in this agenda. And also um, it's really important as we attract talent to the business. So um, we want the best talent in the industry and this becomes a really important consideration for them too. So we take it really seriously. We put a huge amount of, of effort against it and we organize our teams to make sure we're doing really good work in this space. We have been working really hard to constantly um, update our ranges to make sure from an ingredients perspective, but also really importantly packaging we're factoring sustainability into all of our thinking. And we have launched a huge number of products actually in the last 18 months that I'm very proud of because I think they're making, you know, big steps forward to, um, to you know, decrease the impact that we have on the environment. And that's, that's really important to us. Probably one of the most recent examples of that is the Christmas range that we launched for 2020, which is a big range of products that we source from all around the world. And um, the great thing was that we effectively made it, um, uh, we eliminated all the single use plastic in that range, which was a massive step forward. It saved over 2,020 tons of plastic. Um, and you know it's a market leading proposition in that sense. So we're really proud of the work that we've done. The other thing we did was we partnered with um, BBC Earth to produce a range um, that was part of that collection, which is all around bathroom um, products, it's sing there's zero single-use plastic, we're cruelty-free, Leaping Bunny certified, and also carbon neutral, which was a first for us. So um, I think that's a big indicator of how seriously we take this, and we're very, very proud of what we've done, but lots more to do, and we'll continue to work really, really hard in this area. So, um, so yeah, it's very important to us. Um, Sally, I know it's great that you work with WBA. We're really glad to have our partnership with you. I know you were the Forum for the Future advises a lot of um, consumer product companies. Do you think the pandemic has accelerated the prioritization of sustainability, both in the business uh, agenda, but also for consumers? The short answer is yes, it really has. Um, when this pandemic hits and when in March, we were locked down here in the UK, same in the US. I was worried that we might all be slightly distracted by this crisis, but actually what I think we have really seen is an increased ambition amongst both businesses and an increased interest amongst consumers. So when we think about businesses, 
one of the really brilliant facts is that the number of organisations adopting science-based targets for climate doubled last year. So it went up. So the number of organisations making big, bold commitments really increased. And there's lots of surveys that came out towards the end of last year talking about how one survey in particular run by HSBC saying that three quarters of the thousand businesses that they spoke to will be looking to sustainability to ensure a bounce back as we come through this crisis. So looking at how they can drive business performance through efficiency, new products, new services. So I think the COVID crisis has really upped ambition level in business. And then when we look at consumers, we can see that actually there's been a real uptick in interest in big global issues. There was a survey released just a, a few days ago from UNDP. They surveyed over a million people around the world, 50 countries. Two thirds said that they agreed that climate was a global emergency and we needed to do more. And then there's lots of smaller surveys that talk about a real uptick in interest from global issues through to more uh, practical issues, such as you know, how can I reuse and recycle my products? Which brings me to my next question. Um, I know that recycling is something that's really important for WBA. Can you tell us a bit, a bit, a little bit more about how you're meeting that need amongst your consumers? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we've organised ourselves to have a big focus on plastic. In fact, I, I chair the Plastic Steering Committee as part of our CSR. Effort And what's fantastic is we bring all of our businesses together um, to talk about this and to figure out how we can make big progress. So the UK has been leading the way. We've signed the UK Plastics Pact and we're making really good progress um, against our goals. And we're actually using that structure um, and, and those, um, those ambitions to guide us in other markets as well. So it's been a fantastic opportunity to share learning with some of our other international colleagues. On number seven specifically, we've recently just launched a real pioneering uh, recycling scheme powered by technology that's really incentivizing consumers to bring plastics back that they can't recycle. And we have been thrilled by the uptake. Um, we were, we were, you know, with some big ambitions, but we've really seen really positive customer sentiment. So we're really excited about what that can do. Um, Boots have obviously eliminated they were the first retailer to eliminate plastic bag usage in the UK, so we're very proud of that. And they are aiming to be 100% plastic free on all the online deliveries um, in 2021. And they've already reduced uh, their plastic usage in those deliveries by 76%, which is fantastic. And Walgreens are also now getting very involved and they've just joined um, a groundbreaking consortium called Reinvent the Retail Bag to almost uh, replicate what we've done in the UK and make big progress. So. Um, it's a big agenda for us and it's an international one. So it's, it's very exciting. Great. Well, I think we're almost out of time. So it's just so brilliant to see a brand such as WBA really turbocharge sustainability into how it thinks about its products, how it helps its customers lead more sustainable lives. And it's a pleasure to work with you. So nice meeting you, Annie. Thank you for your time. You too, Sally. We, we love our partnership with you and thank you for all your support and I hope people watching have found it uh, interesting and inspiring as to what's possible when you work together. So um, thanks for your time, Sally. Thank you. Our final guest is Richard Curtis, screenwriter, filmmaker, and founder of Red Nose Day. Walgreens has a longstanding partnership with Red Nose Day and it's always a highlight of the year for customers and employees. For many years, Walgreens has celebrated Red Nose Day and in 2020, it was crucial to continue. With everyone's safety in mind, the first ever digital Red Nose was born to keep the spirit of Red Nose Day alive and help the kids who needed it now more than ever. Through innovation and partnership, over $35 million was raised to better the lives of children in need and continue the mission. Hello everyone, Richard Curtis here, founder of Red Nose Day, writer of Love Actually and Notting Hill, sorry about those, and uh, UN advocate for the Sustainable Development Goals. Let me thank all of your team members who are leaving their homes every day and going to work to serve and support everyone in their communities. Then specifically, most important from the bottom of my heart, huge thanks for our amazing charitable work together in 2020. When I was younger, I thought the key factor in fixing the world would be the generosity of ordinary people, that's why I started Red Nose Day, and enlightened behaviour by governments. 
That's why I work for the UN. But in recent years, I've seen that the behavior of the best businesses is the absolute key to creating the world we want. The Walgreens Boots Alliance is one of those businesses. You are all the necessary heroes of this century. Without business setting an example and setting the pace, we just can't fix things. And Red Nose Day money is bringing food and medicine and education and hope into millions of homes in the USA and around the world. So for myself and everyone at Red Nose Day, and on behalf of all the children who can't thank you themselves, thank you. You are simply the best. I want to thank all of you for joining us for Health and Humanity Lessons from the Global Frontline. We learned a lot about inclusive and sustainable health. I want to thank all of our speakers today. And finally, please check out WBA's 2020 CSR report on WBA.com. Thanks again for joining us.